Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. SANS 2021 Ransomware Detection and Incident Response Report, sponsored by Anomaly, Blue Hexagon, Cisco Secure, Corelight, DeepWatch, Egress, Palo Alto Networks, Rapid7, Recorded Future, and Red Canary. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Matt Bromley, SANS Certified Instructor, Jake Williams, SANS Senior Instructor, Samitra Das, CTO and Co-Founder of Blue Hexagon, Alan Liska, Senior Security Architect and Ransomware Specialist of Re at Recorded Future, and Grant Oviat, Senior Director, Short-Term Engagements at Red Canary. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand this webcast over to Matt. Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. I'm excited today to get us kicked off to start to talk about the SANS 2021 Ransomware Detection and Incident Response Report. My name is Matt Bromley. I was the author of the paper, and I'm joined today by several other folks who are gonna be leading us through their thoughts and discussion on ransomware incident response and how this process changes when it comes to ransomware cases. That's really what we wanted to capture in the report was we wanted to focus on areas of why ransomware is different. And I think that we'll walk through a few examples, but more importantly, we need to understand how ransomware incidents change the way that we detect and the way that we respond to such incidents as well, because they're kind of in a field of their own. And that's what we wanted to capture in this report was actionable ways to focus on better detections and how the six step incident response process has also changed slightly when it comes to ransomware cases. That's what we're gonna be walking through today. I'm excited you're joining us. And as always, as with every SANS webcast we do, please make sure you submit any questions you might have through the Q&A window, and we'll happily be getting to those as we have time throughout today's presentation. All right, so with that started, let me go ahead and throw out what I'm gonna call our problem statement. And this is, why is ransomware different? Matt, why are we talking about this report? Why is this report something different? Why don't we just talk about incident response? Why don't we just talk about writing detections for ransomware? Isn't that the same thing? And I've come to find that there's a pretty big gap in what we have been training folks for over the years versus what ransomware actually does or how these attacks take place. And I think for many years, a lot of security teams have been trained for those low and slow adversaries, those APT groups that like to stay hidden in the shadows, um, they take advantage of really, really low key systems or unknown vulnerabilities, and they kind of hide in plain sight, if you will. The problem with this, or maybe it's not a problem, but let's just say the way that our behavior has been conditioned because of this is our threat detection and our threat hunting has been focused on uncovering those needles in the haystack. We've written detections to look for stealthiness We've written detections to look for those adversaries that are hiding in plain sight. But even worse, or perhaps maybe another consideration is, we've also tailored our incident response plans and we've tailored our response times around these types of adversaries as well. So when you look at the average APT breach and you see that they're in the environment for you know four, six, eight months, years at a time, wherever it may have been, detecting the adversary in a week or two actually seems okay. That's a time frame we can all agree. I would rather have a week than I would have a year, if you will. Um, and all of these plans work really well if that's the only threat actor we have to go after. And then we let kind of antivirus take care of the lower end of the threat spectrum, if you will. But what if our adversary was not that interested in staying quiet, but in fact, they were okay with being as loud as possible they were okay with creating a bunch of noise, but they did so in pretty much every opposite way I just discussed. They don't need to be detected. They will tell you they're in the environment. And I'll obviously tear that apart a little bit later. We don't hunt for ransomware threat actors the same way we hunt for APT threat actors. 
Stealthiness is not an attribute they're necessarily concerned with. And an IR plan that takes days or weeks to respond to something is just not going to cut it. We have ransomware breaches these days that go from zero to domain admin in two hours, one hour. We can't afford to say, oh, we'll get around to it or our week long time frame will be okay. Unfortunately, we need to be able to respond a little bit quicker. And that's really what I threw out as kind of our initial problem statement. But then let's also consider the adversary's goals or the adversary's intentions. What happens if my adversary is not actually interested in the data that they've got? They're interested in the value of the data to the organization, how much money they can make off it, and how they can further extort the organization as well. And this is, I think, the big paradigm shift that a lot of folks kind of are not necessarily used to. I can make, or an adversary can make, not me of course, an adversary can make more money by locking up your data and making you pay for access to it than they can slowly slurping that data out and hoping that they'll find a buyer for it. Or we have an adversary who doesn't know what to do with that data. They don't know what to do with all the stolen blueprints. It's not part of their cyber espionage campaign or their multi-year plan to go after your organization. Instead, they've realized, well, we can lock up data, make the organization pay for it, leak a little bit, extort some of them, and all of a sudden, the victim pool, as we've seen happen with ransomware authors, gets wider. In fact, nearly everyone becomes a potential victim at that point. And we've seen this happen. We've seen ransomware actors go after healthcare organizations. We've seen deaths as a result of ransomware attack. At least there's some lawsuit pending in the United States about this. We've seen ransomware actors go after food supplies, critical infrastructure supplies, gas pipelines, um, educational facilities, state and local governments. When you think or when you realize that your objective is to simply make money, all of a sudden everyone with money is a target at this point. And I think this is one of the biggest paradigm shifts and why ransomware has changed the game. So if you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, oh, Matt, I am so tired about hearing ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. Well, remember that ransomware is such a hot topic to talk about, not just because it keeps C-suites and board members up at night, but because it has really switched how we approach incident response and how we approach threats and threat detection. So what we wanted to do in this paper what we wanted you to do after this paper as well is take a look at how the components of detection and response stack up against ransomware attacks. So for example, if your organization has structured your IR plan, your threat detection, your response and everything around a cyber espionage APT, how does that stack up against how ransomware authors do their thing? And that's what we're gonna explore in the paper. That's what we did explore in the paper. And that's what we're gonna talk about on today's webcast as well. But before that, I want to talk about some key differences from the detection and response perspective. So what I've taken is the very basic attack lifecycle, if you will. This is from initial recon all the way to that completing mission. And of course, there's that cyclical repetitive process of escalating privileges and discovering the environment in the middle. And I wanted to overlay how ransomware threat actors sometimes take advantage of really low hanging fruit but also how some of the key differences from a threat actor perspective need to be pointed out here. So first and foremost, the initial compromise part, not the initial recon. The initial recon is something that is usually outside of an organization's control. And these days, ransomware access is sold, it's bought, it's traded amongst bad guys or cyber adversaries, if you will. But it's the initial compromise that ends up being a, a point where we can implement some really strong detections. Of course, you have the typical email. Everyone's you know, obviously familiar with the spear phishing entrance, but we've seen ransomware authors, at least in recent years, really, really take advantage of vulnerabilities that you may have in internet facing devices, sometimes not even devices you may control, sometimes third party devices that have vulnerabilities are being taken advantage of for ransomware deployment. But the big one that we're seeing is that we've seen a significant uptick in has got to be that remote access software. This is your RDP facing the internet, other remote access tools. We could even throw VPN inside of here if we wanted to. But long story short, adversaries have realized, wait, there's already a permitted way into the organization. Why don't I just use that to my advantage? And then when it comes to establishing a foothold, 
I went through in the paper and I define what I'm calling kind of the critical path. Uh, this is not a new concept whatsoever, but it is those systems that exist in nearly every ransomware breach that you'll see. These are the systems that they need to have to steal credentials, the systems they need to have to establish that foothold and maintain persistence. Sometimes these are internal systems allowed to talk outbound. Other times they might be internet facing systems that an adversary has taken advantage of. And then we get to that whole cyclical internal process, that process where they steal credentials, look for additional systems, move throughout the environment, establish additional persistence and keep applying that as need be until they get to the point where they can complete their mission. Now, that middle, uh, that middle repetitive process there, that is one of the key phases of ransomware. It is necessary for the ransomware attacker to go from one to many systems. The nice thing about this is that also gives us a lot of opportunities for detection, and we explored that in the paper as well. And I pulled out, and maybe I should say I'm pulling out and referring to the final stage of the attack lifecycle, the complete mission. That is really the worst place you want to be detecting a ransomware attack. We do not want to be waiting for a ransomware note to be dropped. We do not want to be waiting for an adversary to be emailing us. You don't want to be waiting for Brian Krebs to announce you. You want to be in this sweet spot, one of these three boxes, preferably as, as the old adage goes, as left of the attack or as left of the ransom note as you possibly can. And in the paper, we explored those. In this webcast, I want to highlight some of the key detection mechanisms that we'll use to detect ransomware attacks earlier. But before I do, I want to take a step back and pause. I've got my first detection tip of the webcast here to say that the techniques that, I'm, that I've called out here that I'm walking through, these are not ransomware only. And that is maybe one of the most important distinctions when it comes to ransomware incident response and detection here. These are not techniques that only ransomware authors use. In fact, ransomware adversaries, in my opinion, are notorious for stealing or borrowing techniques from other threat actors. They're notorious for reading blogs or just using Cobalt Strike and following the red team manual and things like that. Um, not the red team field manual, but you know, kind of blog posts or how to how to's and things like that. Um, they're notorious for using some of these wide open, very public tools. And for that reason, uh, some of these attacks have actually seen ransomware attacks stopped, uh, low level attacks stopped by just basic EDR or NDR implementations. And I think that is perhaps one of the first detection tips for anyone out there. If you have no protection whatsoever, even if it's the free built-in antivirus product sold by the operating system manufacturer or offered by the operating system manufacturer, even if that's disabled, you've already cut your security team off at the knees because you've taken out the most basic level of detection, which in a lot of cases, or I should say in some cases, actually works pretty well. Um, I'm not sure where exactly along the attack you'll get detected every single time, but it will be before that ransomware note is deployed. Um, and that again is your low level ransomware attacks, the scripted automated ones, um, maybe that kind of use the generic off the shelf tools with little post configuration. Um, you know, so maybe our first detection tip is to consider having some of those tools in place, even if it may not be kind of the preferred widespread EDR and DR tool get these detection or get these alerting mechanisms in place and use them to your advantage, you'd be surprised just how much low level stuff they can clean off the plate for you. So the second high level area I wanna look at is that critical path or that critical attack path I talked about. And these are systems from an attack perspective that are crucial for the adversary to gain entry into an environment, to be able to communicate outbound and establish that C2 persistence that they can live inside of the environment and survive a reboot. And the last two are perhaps the most important categories of these critical path systems. These are the systems that allow them to harvest credentials and complete the ransomware attack. So credential harvesting may be done from a system with way too many privileges or unaudited accounts. I'll come to that in just a moment. But the ransomware attack these days will go after your hypervisors and backup servers and things like that. Now, there is, of course, that, uh, you know, information security approach that protect the crown jewels mechanism. I want to I wanted to expand that a little bit in this paper and say when it comes to a ransomware attack, it's not just protecting crown jewels, not just the data that keeps the company afloat, if you will, but also the systems that 
must be involved or are likely to be involved in a ransomware attack. Um, your domain controllers, for example, it's not just ransomware, but ransomware attackers are going to want those domain controllers. They're going to want those privileges. We can either make them work to get it, or we can not audit our accounts and have DA privileges all over the place. That's what I'm talking about when I say a critical path. The more I can narrow down these adversary requirements to a single or a handful of systems, the better detection I can wrap around them. It's also worth noting that some of these critical path systems may serve multiple roles or multiple functionalities when it comes to the adversary. So for example, you may have a system or two that have both outbound communications, they have ransomware actor persistence on them, and they're remote access enabled. So they were the entry vector into the environment. And this is a very common setup. I don't like when systems are multi-purpose like that, but if they absolutely have to be for business reasons, great. We now have one place to wrap our detections around. So this is kind of detection tip number two, if you will. Identify the systems that are in this critical path and I want you to do two things with these systems. I want you to ensure that the security team knows about them, meaning there's a list, a CSV, an Excel file, or a SIM rule, or whatever it is. There is knowledge of, hey, here are our domain controllers and their IP addresses. Here's our internet-facing systems and the protocols that they're running and what's available. And did I really just take the words asset inventory or visibility and turn them into critical path? Yes, I did, because that's really what I want to get out of here is I want visibility into these key systems in your environment. I want the security team to have that visibility. Flip side of that, whatever systems you determine may fall in the critical path of an attack, I want telemetry around them as much as possible. Network, endpoint, make sure that they're being fed into a central location, they're being alerted on, and the security team can use that to their advantage. When it comes to that middle cyclical process there, <clears throat> excuse me, a few other things I want you to watch out for. One, overprivileged and unaudited accounts are ripe for ransomware attacks, and this is where adversaries usually have a lot of success. So detection tip number three, there are things that accounts should and should not do. If a non-user begins to act like a user, investigate. If a domain admin starts look, moving around like a spider through the network and they shouldn't be doing so, catch them, stop them, block them, get something in place so that the adversary cannot go any further. Now, remember what I told you in the beginning? Some of this, uh, some of this, some of this attacker movement is going to look like ransomware. It's going to look like other adversaries as well. Some of these techniques, there you go. There's one seeing accounts move all throughout the network without any reason of doing so that should be investigated in any situation. If it's a sysadmin, great. Sorry for disturbing you. Go about your business. But now we know. To add on to that, when it comes to these additional steps inside the process here, escalation, reconnaissance, and lateral movement are absolutely necessary steps for a ransomware attack. Remember, they've got to go from one to many as quickly as they can. These are very noisy steps as well. Think about Bloodhound, the running of multiple internal recon executables. Think about an adversary bringing in custom command line scripts, custom PowerShell, living off the land binaries, spidering out and accessing multiple network shares. All of this activity creates lots and lots of noise. So lean on your detections, lean on your event logs, lean on your NetFlow or your PCAP, lean on your process execution, pull back that EDR telemetry and pivot off of it. If someone runs Bloodhound in your environment, you should know what's going on there. That should be an immediate detection no matter what, because I promise you, anyone that's running Bloodhound, Blue Team, or sorry, Blue Team, this is for you. Anyone that's running Bloodhound needs to be asked why. If it's legitimate, great. Continue. Go about your day. Sorry for the interruption, but we're going to check off that we knew exactly what was going on there. So, of course... As I mentioned, these generate significant endpoint and network noise, so use that to your advantage. If we know certain parts of a ransomware attack are noisier than others, then use these as opportunities to implement detections before those files get locked up. By the way, when I say as much telemetry as possible, my big reasoning for that is we can then start to lean on advanced detections that straddle multiple telemetries as well. Can I take NetFlow data of share access and couple it with Windows event logs that can show me who is doing what and what's happening there? Absolutely. We can then turn to our Sigma rules, our Suricata rules, and we can stretch those across those multiple points of telemetry to get that granular insight into what's happening 
and fire on that activity almost immediately. By the way, I've got two sample Sigma and Suricata rules here. These are drawn out in the paper, but they are ways to show you evidence of potential lateral movement and potential accessing of a network share. So definitely check out these rules. And by the way, detection teams that are out there, you should be writing your own rules as well across those multiple telemetry sets. So that's a, a little snapshot of some of the different detection mechanisms we talked about. The other thing that we addressed in the paper is how the six step or the pick roll incident response process changes because of ransomware. And I wanna call out three key areas that I think change. We just talked about a lot of the identification and detection stage. Remember security team, this is where you have the advantage over the adversary. This is your environment. These are your assets. This is your telemetry. An adversary who breaks into your environment, they are learning that environment for the first time. Yes, they have automated scripts and approaches they can take, but they're still on foreign territory. Use that to your advantage. We cover that in the paper quite in depth. The containment stage is really where I see a lot of changes made to an incident response plan. Whereas before those low and slow espionage cases may have had you kind of pick and choose containment as you were trying to learn more about the adversary and develop intelligence, ransomware I think needs to be the opposite. I want my containment to be swift. Systems on the critical path, isolate them. Disable those abused counts, block traffic and malware, stop these things from running. I don't wanna get into a game of whack-a-mole, but I do wanna cut off access as quickly as I can so that the malware can spread no longer. And last but certainly not least, that eradication into recovery phase, this is where we wanna watch out for retargeting. Don't forget, and I try to explain this every time I help an organization with a ransomware attack. Don't forget, you are disrupting a revenue stream for an adversary. If that revenue stream is poised to make, it, make enough money, they will likely try to come back. Remember, the second time an adversary comes back to your environment, they're smarter than they were before. They know more about assets, more about accounts. So that eradication phase has got to be a complete elimination of the adversary. Patch, recover, retool, do whatever you need to do in case you missed it the first time to make sure we don't miss again. I never ever want an adversary to be able to walk up to an environment, press repeat and achieve the same level of success. So everyone, that gave a really quick snapshot of what I'm kind of considering the uh, brief, a brief overview of this report. Again, it was great being able to pull this together and focus on some of the differences and how ransomware impacts the detection and incident response processes. I'm now going to hand it over to the rest of my presenters for this webcast to take us through a quick panel discussion and talk to us more about their views on how ransomware is impacted, how IR resp or incident response is impacted, and all the things that we need to watch out for going into 2022. All right. Thank you very much. Alrighty, so, hey Matt, that was fantastic. Really, really appreciate that. I've got a couple of other folks joining me as, as well, uh, from Blue Hexagon, uh, certainly from Recorded Future and Red Canary. Um, there's uh, Sumitra uh, hey. joining us from, uh, from Blue Hexagon. Sumitra, give us a little bit about your background. How are you involved with the ransomware ga game here? Hi, Blue Hexagon. So I've been working on you know, security for a long time, starting at US CERT and Microsoft Intel, other places. At Blue Hexagon, we have a cloud-native security platform which you know, does NDR, uh, looks at privilege escalation and other attacks. And so we've been working at the sort of front end, as we talked about in the, uh, in the, in the paper, looking at initial access and looking at as the adversary is moving laterally, how can you use these network telemetry detections to sort of stop them from tracks? Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, next, uh, but certainly not least here, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, with Alan here because he's the next one down on the uh, uh, next one down on the slide. Alan, give us a little bit of your background. How do you fit into the ransomware game here? Sure. So uh, I'm an intelligence analyst for Recorded Future. And what we do is we look at um, <clears throat> the nature of the attacks, how the attacks are changing, track the adversaries, <clears throat> provide indicators to our clients, help um, you know, help both, you know, clients defend themselves, incident response firms, look for indicators. And then on Twitter, I refer to ransomware actors as bastards. So that's really my primary role is mocking them. Love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, Grant, tell us a little about yourself and, and how you and Red Canary fit into the whole ransomware game here. Hey, Jake. Yeah, hey. my uh, 
in a past life, I was an incident response consultant. So I remember when uh, fast and loud was not the name of the game, but now uh, as part of my day job at Red Canary, we're working to support incident response teams specifically in that identification and containment uh, stage and help them go faster. So there's so much ransomware going on out there that even incident responders need additional support and Red Canary can help. In fact, yeah, definitely. Uh, Grant and I know each other from exactly that. Uh, so, um, and uh, I, I would be remiss not to mention that I've worked with Recorded Future and Blue Hexagon in the past as well. So this is a great, it's great to get the team together here. Um, we're actually, uh, I've got a couple of questions I'm going to start with for the uh, for the panel. I'm Jake Williams, by the way, from SANS, but I think pretty much most of you know me. Um, but uh, I've got, a, I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, I've got a couple of questions we're going to start with right up front, but if you have questions, uh, please submit those um, and we'll get, to, we'll get to those questions as well from the audience. This is, if, if you haven't kind of caught on here, this is a dream team of ransomware experts that are coming at this from several different places. You've got uh, Blue Hexagon on the NDR side, uh, you've got Red Canary uh, largely on the EDR side, um, as well as uh, you know just general incident response side. And then you've got Alan on the uh, heavy, heavy on the threat intelligence and mocking threat actors side. Um, so, you know, between the uh, between the group here, I think we're going to have a fantastic, uh, fantastic discussion. Um, I actually am going to start with uh, Sumitra um, on a question about network traffic. And, and we talk a lot about, as we talk about NDR, a lot of folks focus on that, uh, you know, on that east-west, uh, you know, traffic detection, right? Um, why is it that we're focusing on that and not the north-south side? Uh, you know, what, what, what is that? Why are we, because for those not familiar, by the way, north-south is ingress, egress, east-west is, is internal traffic. We talk a lot about the internal. Why are we not catching it necessarily at the, the north-south as it comes in? Right. I think this is a great question. And one of the things we see with customers is they do understand they have something on the north-south. They may have put an NGFW. So like, okay, I don't have anything east-west. Let me put something there. So that's usually the beginning of that project, which is which is a great motivation. You need to have telemetry there. But the question, if you look at any of these attacks, there is an initial access. There's going to be some payload coming in. There'll be some cobalt strike. There'll be a C2. They can't survive without a C2. So I think having advanced analytics on the north-south is equally critical because that's part of these uh, attacks all the time. Right? You don't just magically end up in east-west without having done anything north-south. right? And just having a signature-based perimeter prevention is typically not enough. If that was enough, we would not have all these attacks. right? The key thing is most of these perimeter devices have lists, lists of hashes lists of Yara rules, and those lists can't be infinite. If you look at malware on virus total, there's 1 million new per day, right? There's no way you have 1 million hashes every day coming into your firewall and checking for those things, right? So I think having these advanced analytics and visibility both on both on north, south, and east, west is pretty critical. All the customers tend to, or organizations tend to start east, west because they have nothing there. But I think for a ransomware kill chain, it's important to have both of those pieces, looking at initial and C2 on north south, and looking at the you know lateral movement privilege escalation on the east west side. I think that's sure. critical for both pieces. Yeah, and, and either you want to, uh, Alan or Grant, either you want to contribute anything there. Yeah, so I think you know when you talk north south, really one of the challenges is the diversity of the attacks, and I think this was really highlighted very well in the report. You know. Um, you know, we're now at the point where 50% 50, 50 or more attacks involve credential reuse. So you've got to be able to monitor for all of your exposed credentials uh, on, on underground forums. But then, you know, and, and there's a chart that uh, several people on Twitter have been contributing to of all of the exploits that ransomware actors have used. And I think we're up to like 50 different exploits, ex you know, except in Kaseya, none of these are zero day. But your edge is being constantly bombarded by ransomware actors or initial access brokers looking for ways to exploit. And then you still have to work, worry about phishing on top. So there, you know, the diversity of the attack surface that ransomware actors are taking advantage has really grown over the last year and a half or so, I think, in line with the increase in remote work. Um, and so it's much, much harder to detect ransomware at the edge um, than it is going east-west, I think, at some point. Yeah. Grant, any thoughts here as well? Yeah, I also think, you know, the east-west focus is, Matt covered it really well, that's where the noise is, right? So that's where your velocity picks up, that's where the spread is happening. And so people are focusing on what's loudest and maybe not what's most restrictive or further up, furthest up the, the chain, right, to use the old adage. So I think it's ransomware is the malware that tells you about itself, right? And it tells you about itself after it makes a whole bunch of noise. 
And so uh, that's the place that people focus and may miss the north-south. Yeah, and just for whatever it's worth here too, I'll throw out here, I think that there's a little bit of survivorship bias in this as well, right? Because it's the, you know, survivorship meaning the, what we've been successful in detecting or what you hear about people saying, oh my gosh, we detected this thing. And it's like, okay, cool. But but that's where there's, you're accelerating towards the end stage at that point. And, and you know, the earlier you catch it, Grant, to your point, everything, everybody's point here, the earlier we catch it, the better off we, we are. Um, so I'm gonna pivot over here to Alan. Um, Alan, uh, there was a finding from Palo Alto Networks that 50% of ransomware attacks originate with remote access. This pivots well into what you're talking about here. Um, and uh, I, I think that may surprise a lot of organizations, right? That that 50%, because we hear a lot when I consult with CISOs, it's phishing, phishing, phishing. And it's like, uh, maybe not, right? 50% start here. Um, what should organizations be doing specifically around that? And even with a subset of that credential stuffing and reuse attacks? Yeah. So, and, and I think to your point, um, you know, a kind of fascinating, you hit on a really important point. Nobody brags about stopping a ransomware attack at the edge, which may be one of the reasons why East West gets the attention. Look at this. We caught these cobalt strike beacons or, you know, versus, yeah, okay, we stopped another phishing attempt um, is not, maybe not as, no, no one's going to invite you to RSA to give a talk about that. Um, but... <laughs> Um, but but yeah, so one of those things I, I think to again to your point is we're not paying enough attention to these credential reuse, credential stuffing attacks, and the growth of the initial access broker market. Like I, I think there's still this misconception, and Matt did a great job of laying this out. Of it, ransomware isn't just one guy in his mom's basement uh, uh, conducting the attack from end to end. It's a business, and there's all these little cottage industries. And you have to remember that there are so many people out there now that are looking for ways to get in, because even if they're not going to deploy the ransomware, they can flip and resell your access, kind of like an HGTV show of, um, you know, and, and make a quick profit on it and let the ransomware actor do the rest of the work. So you really need to be a monitoring for credential dumps on underground markets. Have I been pwned is a great service for, for you know, getting started with something like that. Um, and then you need multi-factor authentication. Like you, you have to, anything that's on the edge has to have some sort of multi-factor authentication on it. And, and ideally you always want to, you know, decrease your attack surface whenever possible. If you don't need those remote desktop protocol servers or those Citrix servers, let's go ahead and shut them down. If your vendors require them, have them behind a VPN or firewall or something like that, like there, there needs to be some protections in there. Got it. Grant, uh, any additional thoughts here? I think it's interesting to look at, you know, the, the credential stuffing and the use of valid credentials as a larger trend that even is, is going broader than ransomware. So when we think about um, compromise that's happening in cloud environments today, right, it's it's much less custom tooling and it's using the same valid credential approach, maybe less stuffing, right? But the idea is still, and I'm looking for valid credentials, gathering them wherever that may be, that buys me time during the idea Identification phase, and then to move rapidly to achieve objectives, and so uh, it's it's becoming harder that additional sort of that initial identification, and we're seeing this sort of valid credential that used to be a smaller player, I would say, uh, related to nation state activity, becoming a pretty compelling force in the ransomware space, and even as uh, we're looking at cloud compromise as well. Definitely, Samitra, thoughts here. Yeah, this is a great point made by both Alan and Grant. I mean, even the cloud, like we routinely see AWS, Azure, people leave things open, and it's not enough to look at NetFlow. One of the issues with NetFlow is you just have this five tuple. You need to look at, you know, if you look at the deep packets, you'll actually see, oh, this, there's an RDP thing sitting in Azure or wherever it is. And, you know, how is it being, what are being used, what are the accounts being used, uh, is access being denied, SSH brute forcing is another one that we see all the time. And the valid accounts in the cloud are actually pretty interesting that, we see a lot of phishing attacks that are going after AWS access keys rather than trying to move laterally on-prem because you know that that's where the crown jewels are. Or the other thing we see is, oh, I got into a container. I got into, I'm going to look in the container for what other things are there that I can move laterally instead of doing. There's no SMB maybe on, in AWS, but you do have these keys and SSH, you know, all these things that you can actually use to move laterally in the environment. So keeping track of this privilege and where they are and what they can lead to is actually pretty critical, especially as organizations move to the cloud. And the other piece I see is on-prem and cloud, you know, these are just two networks that you own. People can move between these as well because you could 
get an on-prem laptop, get keys from there, move move to the cloud, and so on and so forth. So looking at valid accounts, I think, are very, very critical for mitigating ransomware, both on-prem and the cloud. And you're seeing attacks on S3 now. It's no different than, you know, a Nash share on-prem. You can get access there. You can encrypt things. You can, you know, extort them out. All of that is possible in the cloud as well. Yeah. And hey, to, to what Samitra said there, this is fantastic because, um, you know, the, the a lot of folks focus on, you know, and I hear, like, it's AWS. Ah, oh, it's all Linux. Don't worry. And I'm like, I'm extra worried, right? Like, yes, it's not SMB. I get that, right? But, like, typically, particularly as we get into, you know, infrastructure as code, what I find is, you know, there's, like, one key to rule them all, like SSH key. And then from there, typically somebody's hard coded, you know, one of these, uh, you know, one of these API keys, and instead of using IAM rules, and it's just game on. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's way better than domain admin. Like it makes domain admin look like it doesn't even matter anymore. So yeah, <laughs> totally great points. Absolutely love that. Uh, Grant, I want to pivot over to you here. And, and by the way, folks, if you have questions, please drop them in the box. We'll start uh, handling some audience questions as well. Uh, but uh, Grant, um, I got a question here about endpoint security. Um, if if you're living a little bit, uh, let's call it uh, under budget, your, your security stack just includes antivirus, right? Um, is that worth monitoring at all, or should I kind of just write that off? It's a good question. Obviously, I think folks that are in that position are like, I wish I had more budget to go buy an EDR or something else to get more behavioral coverage. But often you're not in that position, and you're like, antivirus have been told for years is not going to fit the bill. Uh, I think Matt spoke on it really well. There's a lot of tool reuse, a lot of open source tools or publicly available tools that are being used, and that's where AV really shines. And so uh, I would say blocked in prevention and even what's native to your operating system still has a lot of value here. Uh, and I would even go as, so far as to say one of the first actions that a lot of ransomware operators take is disabling that native antivirus solution. So yeah. one, that's that's a detection, but if it wasn't valuable and stopping them from their revenue stream, they wouldn't disable it in the first place. So I'd encourage everyone to to monitor and also monitor the the stopping of that specific service uh, to give you some some good coverage. So make use of what you have. AV is still valuable in, in this kind of noisy type of compromise. Yeah. Now I want everybody to know that that uh, Grant died a little bit inside. I don't know if you saw that when I first asked the question. Like, died a little bit inside when I first asked it here. Um, but I'm going to pitch back over to uh, <clears throat> to Sumitra. Uh, any thoughts around this on if AV is all you got, what, are we still worth it? You want with Grant or you have a different opinion? I think it, I think it, you definitely want to have, you know, any any no, any information you can get about any actor, it's always good to have that. They probably use hashes, as you said. Some of the Cobalt Strike beacons, there's, there's indicators there. They don't customize it with malleable profiles. You could find those kinds of things. But you do want the AV to be having some kind of predictive capability. There's you know, you know, AI-based AVs, I would say they can be better at catching some of the variants. You know, we have millions of variants coming out. And so I think just a pure signature, you know, like a CLAM AV equivalent is going to be, I, I would think is hard to really catch a real attack. Most of the time when we see these things, we'll see a, like a Mimikatz. We're going to see it very mutated. It's not going to be the original Mimikatz, right? So the hash typically won't help, right? Maybe if it's a very mom and pop kind of actor, it might help. But you do need a way to find, you know, samples that are not on virus total that's the key thing you have to find things that no one knows about because when they're going up to organization they're not going to reuse the exact same sample they might reuse a technique but they won't use a sample so my feeling is if it's a pure signature based av it may be limited although it's still good to have better than nothing but mm -hmm. i think you do need some predictive capabilities either on the you know, network or endpoint side to find these kinds of neural attacks both actually even on east west most people will look at behaviors but you know they transfer a payload can you actually tell that this file sent over smb what is it like? Why is it there? Is it a driver or is it like a, what is it trying to do? Is does it look like Mimikatz even though it's been heavily obfuscated? So I think there's a lot of value there to be able to look at objects as they're being moved around inside your environment. Yep. Alan, uh, be, be the tiebreaker for us here, right? We kind of got the, you know, AV is worth it, right? Definitely, which is the camp I'm going to sit in here. I, I don't disagree with Sumitra either, but what are your thoughts, Alan? Yeah. So I, I think with the right capabilities enabled, AV can be worth it. Um, so like Windows Defender has a ransomware detection module that you can enable. Um, the, the important thing is to understand the capabilities of your AV and enable the things that will help detect ransomware as much as possible. I get it. I've worked um, with a lot of small businesses. Some of them can't even get uh, EDR even if they want it because they don't have enough seats. Um, so they have to do what they want to do. And the AV works well if you do it as part of a comprehensive strategy. 
Um, generally though, of course, if you're a small business, it's hard to have the monitoring and everything in place to properly do it. You know, as Grant points out, um, one of the best detections for ransomware early on is disable of the AV. How many organizations, especially small organizations, are actually able to detect and then act on that. It's you know kind of like you go back to the target breach from 2013. All the indicators were there. Nobody was looking in the right console. So sure. that's where having an MSSP really helps um, that, that can handle some of that for you. And, and, and honestly, I'd rather have AV with Windows logging and uh, Python uh, or, or PowerShell logging and other things being looked at by an MSSP if I have limited budget then have an EDR that I can't actually manage and look at the alerts for. Like that that combination, I think, is going to be better value for your limited security spend. Okay. So I've got an audience question. That's fantastic, by the way, here too. Um, and I everybody has great points on this. This is one of these I think we could spend the whole hour on just just discussing back and forth. Like, but but this actually dovetails very well in an audience question about uh, you know what do you do? We're going to take leave the we have no maturity to the, we've actually invested a little bit. We have some maturity um, and, you know, basically should, should we be focusing on enhancing north-south detections or east-west detections or enhancing incident response plans to respond quicker to a ransomware attack once it's detected? And since this is, starts on the network side, Samitra, I'm going to hand it to you first. Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a very, I think it depends on the maturity of the team, like how do they handle alerts, but one thing we've seen some customers do who are more mature is they have an NDR platform, they have an EDR platform, right? And then the key is how do you correlate both of them inside some other platform or, you know, in, in some cohesive way. So having those two piece streams of information talk to each other is actually very important. They can't be, you can't go to this tool and see this and then go there and see that. You want to see, oh, I saw this C2 coming from this lab, from this specific, you know, endpoint. Did, was there a malware three days ago that came there for whatever reason wasn't cleaned up? And then what are the east-west thing that it's doing? And some of those could be, you know, it could be Sysmon from your endpoint, it could be your EDR, it could be what the network is telling you. So we've seen people combining those into a SIM and then prioritizing. I think it's important to not just put the information somewhere, but combining them to figure out what is the top risk right now in your environment. So one of the things we've seen doing is what are the top 10 risks, given what these tools are telling me, and then how do you prioritize that? Because as Alan is saying, you, you may have all the alerts, but if they're not prioritized and ranked, you may not be able to get, them, get to them in time. And if you look at Kaseya and the recent attacks, they come in on a Friday evening when everyone's out and they want to, you know, they are really, a lot of them are smash and grab. You may have the IAB and the ransomware affiliate. They may, they may have been in there for a while, like, you know, consolidating. There's a lot of consolidation going on, but the actual attack will unfold very, very quickly once that's happening, right? So I think it's critical to have these rankings and risks across tools to be able to actionably do something and blunt the attack. Perfect. So uh, Grant, I'll remind you the question here. Uh, do you focus on north-south detections, enhancing north-south detections, enhancing east-west detections, or do you work on enhancing your incident response plans to respond quicker to ransomware attacks? Grant? It's a really great question, and I'm going to throw out that it depends based on their maturity in other areas. So with, with no information, the point I do want to make is that ransomware has opened the aperture for vulnerable organizations. It's no longer just my intellectual property that matters, it's my ability to generate money in my business operations. And so I would say instant response and instant management in general is much larger um, than the bits and bytes, and it's a risk conversation of how do I, I've got reporting regulations that I need my legal team to be aware of. Uh, I have all these external partners that are involved for instant response or supporting me during an engagement. And so a really, unpracticed instant response plan can lead to terrible outcomes when something starts going. So I would say without any information, only that they have a good sense of maturity and they're asking this question in the first place, it makes me think that you've got some coverage on the north, south, east, west side. Uh, if you haven't invested in a written and practiced instant response plan, I would start there next. There's a big key here that I don't want anybody to miss because Grant didn't really accentuate it. He said written and practiced, and that's a that was all in caps at the back end of that because <laughs> it should all be in caps. Uh, Alan, uh, again, east, west, north, south, or incident response plan. Yeah. So, Jake, I, last time you and I did one of these together, uh, I, I mentioned that I had walked into uh, a, a, a one organization, and it's the only time I've ever seen th this specific thing happen, where 
there was actual dust on the incident response on the binder that held the incident response plan. Like I had, you know, if I had the white glove, I could have uh, wiped it and, and shown them. I, I think those two really have to go hand in hand because if you're updating your north south or your east west um, protections, you then have to update your incident response plan in order to accommodate those changes that you're making anytime that you're doing that. Uh, anytime you're making changes, anytime you're making updates, you have to update the incident response plan so that somebody kind of walking in off the street um, has the ability to go in and have accurate and up-to-date information. And, and I think that goes you know, to both what uh, Grant and Sumitra were saying is that you have to, uh, you, you know, all of these things are important and they are all kind of tied in together and you know, it, it is, a living process. As you make changes to your security plan, you need to update your disaster recovery, you need to update your incident response, and then you need to test through all of that repeatedly. Sure. You know, one of, for me at least, one of the most critical pieces of an incident response plan in the first place is my collection management framework. What data do I have available to answer questions? And to your point, if you're changing that, my goodness, the incident response plan must be updated and hence not have dust on it. This pivots right back to what Grant said about well-tested. Um, and of course, you know, what Sumitra was talking about for different enhancements that we can make for doing better detection, both North, South and East, West. Um, so I got another audience question here. I'm going to pitch this one to Grant first, but of course, you know, we'll, we'll allow for some uh, some feedback as well. What's your response strategy? They're calling this ransomware 5.0. Uh, basically, everything but your data is encrypted, right? So basically, they're looking and saying, hey, the, they're worried about this is going beyond the encryption, right? So it's credentials for sale, customers being extorted, right? We've seen this, I know, in a couple of cases, um, you know, basically the uh, organization being extorted, right? We're going to release your data, uh, you know, threat of publishing the stolen data. Well, what's the response strategy for that, Grant? How do we need to change? It's a really great question. Uh, the 5.0 spot puts people in... Um, and I think a lot of it will depend on the organization, right? Like what is the cost to rebuild? What is the cost to move to a better position? It becomes a, um, we've seen some of these conversations play out live, you know, with with kind of pipeline conversations. What do we do? Is, is this a situation where uh, we kind of cave and rebuild? Regardless, whatever decision you make, there has to be retooling and action that that happens afterwards, right? Like there should be lessons learned from this incident, addressing the underlying vulnerabilities, understanding what happened. Um, I think it ends up being a business decision on how do I respond? Is this something that we entirely rebuild and start from the ground up? Or is it something that we need to actually offer payment for, regain operations, and then fix ourselves internally? Uh, it's hard to make a blanket statement on that, but I'm interested in what the other panelists have to say as well. Yeah, sure. Sumitra, I'll hand it to you next. Yeah, I think this is sort of interesting. If you look at what the attackers want, it's some kind of leverage. It's not, like you said, it's not about the crown jewels anymore. And so the first leverage really, I encrypt your data, I make it hard for you to operate. But now because of this double extortion that we're seeing, because you know, there are better backup companies, you know, there's zero trust backup. They're not able to go and infect your backup as effectively as before. They still do it, but it's not as easy. So the, now they're going to exfiltrate a little bit or a lot and then use that, right? And the third point is, even if I exploit a little bit, I can still name and shame the company that could drop their stock price, right? So there's multiple forms. And the fourth one, of, of course, is maybe you're running an OT network and I'm going to go, go and find Honeywell and sort of disrupt your any any processes that are running that. So there's these three or four forms of leverage that attackers have. And if, if one of them is cut off because maybe you have a great backup system, they'll move on to the next one. So this becomes key to saying, can I stop them as early as I can, moving more ship left in that spectrum saying, to limit the kind of leverage that they have in your network. And that's going to be critical. Going forward, you know, it's not just going to be about encrypting data because there's, you know, the backup guys have gotten better. You can restore your data. That's that's getting there. I think most people are investing there as well. But the question is, can you stop them from exfiltrating too much? Uh, can you stop them from exfiltrating enough that it's shameful for your company's brand, right? So that's going to be a harder problem. It requires us to detect much earlier than we've been used to doing this so far. Sure. Alan, what are your thoughts here? Yeah. So, you know, interestingly, that's where we've seen the innovation from ransomware actors this year is in that extortion ecosystem. Um, you know, you know, because most ransomware attacks we see now, it's Cobalt Strike, it's Bloodhound, it's Mimi Cats, it's kind of the same tools 
used mm -hmm. over and over again. Maybe sometimes, you know, iteratively interesting, but it's kind of the same things over and over again. But just this year, we've seen it go from, you know, double extortion to triple extortion to, you know, blackmailing executives by threatening to post pictures of their girlfriends um, to, uh, you know, inauthentic Twitter campaigns with the NRA to, you know, m emailing parents of, you know, uh, children for schools that have been hit with ransomware, uh, even talking about, you know, uh, uh, disrupting mergers and acquisitions with, uh, you, know, you know, with extortion information. So that, that ex oh, and of course, don't call the cops. Don't call the cops and don't call ransomware negotiators or we'll delete all of your data. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the extortion ecosystem is really expanded for ransomware actors this year. And I think it hits right on, on what Sumitra has said that, it's because we're getting better at restoring from backup, you know, and, and I know this is a long time coming, but, you know, I, I, part of the problem is in 2016, 17, when we were all were saying, please, please, please have good backups, have offline backups, have all this other stuff. Um, it takes two years, three years to go through that process for most organizations. Like we can say here, you should have good backups that are offline, um, but then organizations actually have to, you know, go through the POC process. They have to, you know, select the vendor. Then they have to get the funding. Then they have to implement it. And that takes a long time to do that. And I think we're now at that point. So that becomes, now we have to figure out other ways to do the triple, quadruple. I don't know what 10 times extortion is, but, you know, we're kind of getting to that area. Yeah. I'll pivot off a couple of things that they got mentioned here. And I think they're very profound, right? Um, that, you know, Alan, to your point on the backup side, yeah, definitely, right? I mean, it's it's so many security folks have never done systems engineering um, that it's it's really easy to to be like, why didn't they just just have backups, right? And, and it's this you know this multi-year budget and implementation process in a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 there with you, and, and and really just from a response plan standpoint, we have to be more nimble. I love what Grant said about the uh, you know really bringing in the business and talking about the business operations of of, of everything, and you know because at the end of the day, all of this is information security right we're just supporting the business right um so absolutely love these i uh, love these responses we got a an absolute like could not have scripted a better question for the panelists here because i know that all of your products involve some form of uh, ai or, or ml artificial intelligence and, and or machine learning um and uh so i'm going to pitch this uh first to uh, first to grant is there a particular aspect of the detection and response cycle where you see the most potential for AI or ML improvements that have not yet been fully realized. So Grant, I'm gonna kick that to you first. It's a great question. And I think from a security analyst perspective, the interesting, the interesting piece is uh, what, what folks realize when they're managing their own security data is the fear that comes with it from an inexperienced analyst. I'm making a split second decision that has the implication to ransom my company if I do it wrong, right? And I need more information faster to make this decision, but I don't know where to look. And so what I see a lot of innovation or potential for innovation is pulling in uh, that those second order investigative artifacts up front. So alerts as initial leads, and then coloring that with additional context from investigative sources that are in your environment to help you make faster decisions. So uh, I think it's, less about having some um, you know, whiz bang solution that solves it all for you end to end. And it's really about building a mech suit for humans to help them make faster decisions, right? To use an analogy there. Yeah. Sumitra, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think AI, I mean, you know, we, we live and breathe this thing, but you know, the, the question about AI is really about trust. How much can you trust the decision something is making? Like if you look at a self-driving car, if I didn't use deep learning, it would probably be running into trees every five seconds, right? So the question is, What's the false positives? What are the false negatives on your AI? And how much effort is it just like, you know, some bunch of rules and you're calling it AI or is it really is it really something that's predicting something reasonable? And that, how much can you trust it? If you look at uh, medical devices, you know, people have applied deep learning AI to medicine and FDA has only approved a couple of devices because can the doctors trust this when it's life and death? Can you trust this AI to not you know run over someone on the on the crosswalk? So it's something similar here. I mean, it may not be life and death, but it could be for an organization. You know, if I if I take a wrong verdict, I may disrupt business operation. If I choose not to trust it, I might have missed this ransomware, right? And I think some of these issues that we see, there's so much data, 
you do need some kind of AI to be able to, you know, at least shorten or, or so surface the things that are important. I think that's where this, these kind of things shine. And if you use things like deep learning, which is what we've invested in, you can get to the nothing is perfect. And when someone says zero false positives, 100% detection, it, it should never be possible. It's probabilistic, statistical, it should, it's unlikely. But the question is, can you get to the point where an analyst can at least trust the decision in, in a lot of cases? And can you, the second important piece is, can you explain your decision? So one thing we focused on at the last RS is we try to predict the MITRE attack tactics, predict, not, not run it in a sandbox, try to predict from the sample from an AI model. So can you predict that and give more information, not just say, hey, this is good or bad. Why do you think it's good or bad? So that gives more trust to the analyst or prioritization with what to do with the AI. So I think AI is definitely useful, but if you just use it as a black box, yes or no, it's hard to operationalize the AI. And that's where the key challenge is. How do I operationalize it and how do I use it in an effective SOC you know, workflow or IR workflow? Okay. Uh, Alan, go ahead. It, you know, it's amazing that all of us work for companies that have AI and ML um, and, and deep learning capabilities, and yet all of us are somewhat skeptical. Um, you know, there's a, this disconnect between us as practitioners and what marketing is saying, um, which I always find fascinating. Um, but I do think, and, and I think you know, uh, both Brandon and Sumitra have kind of really hit on this, is there is definitely a place for this to help filter out the noise. Like one of the things that almost every ransomware actor does right before they encrypt is they delete shadow copies. And the only thing that deletes shadow copies is the way the way that ransomware does is ransomware. So, but the, the problem is if you set up an alert on that, by the time it filters through your SIM and you know gets to an analyst to take action on it, um, you know, your systems are already encrypted. Like it, right, it's already too late because that process just takes a while to get through. Whereas, again, if you had uh, machine learning AI that, that you could trust, that could say, oh, this is a thing that I know is bad associated with ransomware, I'm going to delete that process. Um, and I know like Florian Roth has built a tool that, um, that, that will do this uh, of Racine. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to have an AI ML process for that, that's where these kind of things can be helpful, where these things are like, I have high confidence that this is really bad and I need to stop that process and I'm worth the it's worth the occasional false positive for the amount of damage that i'm going to prevent if i don't stop this and that's really where i see um that kind of ai and machine learning really being effective okay definitely and that's this is such a fantastic discussion too by the way folks because again i i want to want to color all of these answers here right with and and remember that all of these folks work with products, right, or work specifically for vendors whose products are built on the back of artificial intelligence and, and, and machine learning, right? And so, um, you know, when, when you hear these answers of folks, just understand, like, it's this isn't random people just, you know, spitting out a couple of uh, couple of thoughts here. These are three folks who gave more or less kind of that same space of, of, of answer there. And, and I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to have, you know, to have heard this. Um, we've got about uh, two-ish minutes left. I'm just gonna go speed round here. Um, you know, closing thoughts uh, on ransomware and evolution. Uh, you got 30 seconds, Samitra, go. Yeah, yeah. I think we need, we need to move shift left more and more. We need to go earlier. The attackers are getting smarter, as Alan said, you know, they're figuring out how to extort better. We need to go earlier in the chain. We need to worry much more about cloud as people are migrating digitally. You know, people, you know, assume cloud is safe, but it's no different than your any other network. In fact, it could be worse because you can misconfigure it, you know, almost instantly. So focus more on the left, try to detect early, use AI ML to help you, you know, scale your operation. I think that's the key message for ransomware. Sure, Grant? Yeah, I, I agree with Samitra there. Moving left is gonna be important. I think also taking advantage of some of the, the topics that Matt covered in the paper, um, really looking for east-west still has value, right? There's a lot of noise there and things that you can look at. Um, it's the only malware that's going to make itself known at the end. So we're trying to get it before that point, right? And look for identifying behavior uh, before you actually have full compromise. I'm gonna reinforce incident response preparedness in general is a huge theme. Um, velocity has increased, it's no longer low and slow and the nature of the game has changed. Uh, I think cloud um, as well as traditional infrastructure is, is at risk in new and novel ways and having an up-to-date written and practice incident response plan is more important now than ever. So continue to invest in that. Grant, you got the closing word here. 
Yeah. Sorry, so, Alan, my apologies. Alan, you've got the closing word. I'm so sorry. Yep. No worries. Um, so I'm at CyberWarCon today here in uh, D.C., and uh, Chris Krebs was talking about the arrests that have happened this year with ransomware actors, which is generally a positive thing. But one of the things that I think he made a really good point on is that what the arrests are doing is they're getting the chuckleheads, his term, not mine, out of the uh, out of the market and leaving only the really skilled ransomware actors, the ones that are going to go after your cloud infrastructure, your ESXi, your, your Linux servers. Um, and so great, we may see a drop off in ransomware attacks, but the ones that we're going to see are going to be more severe and they're the ones from the, the people that have managed to not get arrested to, to actually practice good OPSEC and so on. So I do think that's what's go, what we'll see going forward. And, and I think both uh, Grant and Sumitra have really good points. You need to have a good and tested incident response plan, but you also need to be better at keeping the ransomware actors from getting in the network in the first place. Well, folks, this has been fantastic. This is all the time we have, unfortunately. I could do this all day, pulling from Captain America. Um, but uh, I want to thank uh, Sumitra, Grant, and Alan, um, for also known as Grant Number Two, uh, for being with us here today. Really, really appreciate it. This has been a fantastic discussion. I thank you for bringing this to the SANS audience. Carol, I'm going to hand it over to you to close out this uh, what's been just a fantastic webcast. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Matt, Jay, Sumitra, Alan, and Grant, for your great presentation. And to Anomaly, Blue Hexagon, Cisco Secure, Corelight, DeepWatch, Egress, Palo Alto Networks, Rapid7, Recorded Future, and Red Canary for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.